like systems are go here and well I'm really happy to be here back in uh, home stomping grounds and you, you're very very lucky now because when I was growing up in Skinny Atlas and going to Cornell we didn't have all the wonderful wonderful health food stores and natural food stores and local farmers and these kinds of things going on and so now it's it's really wonderful to see these things happening because consciousness is reaching a critical mass and people are starting to get it and they're starting to be committed to uh, what I call getting around to it, <laughs> getting back around to it. So I always start my presentations here with this picture of this apple and um, the old phrase, which I'm sure you've heard before, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, right? That was one of the most, uh, that, as we were growing up, oh, that was like the health advice. Well, this is what my, my grandfather, uh, he used to be, he was a supervisor of, um, of Skinny Atlas for many years, illustrious guy, uh, old farmer. And he used to say, well, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. So he and I would always share our favorite. He would always share an apple, you know, in the afternoon, out in the milk barn, whatever. And, and we had our time together and everything. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> at that point, at 12, 13, or whatever, I didn't realize what his favorite form of apple a day was. And that was, I found out about that one time when I was, we're playing hide and seek. And I'm, I'm counting, and I'm in the side, counting on the side of the barn like this, one, two, one, two, three, right? I'm counting. And I'm around the corner from the potato cellar door. And I'm like, oh, this is weird. I'm hearing giggling coming from the potato cellar, which is, of course, where they keep the seed crops and, you know, storage crops. A lot of families did that um, for many years. And I'm like, wait a minute. This, that's grandpa and dad and the hired men. They're giggling? I, I never heard grown men giggling before and I still haven't ever. So after, <laughs> after they went, that was between, that was after haying and before they went milking, they were taking their afternoon break. So I'm like, after they went to go get the cows, I'm like, kids, come on, we gotta go down there and see what's, what's, what's going on in the potato cellar. Ah, then we discovered quickly what Grandpa's favorite apple a day was, a little jelly glass full of hard cider down there and the keg down there. So one of my favorite stories. And the reality is these kinds of experiences have happened to me all my life, and I'm very, very grateful for those great stories now that were events that happened in childhood. So who am I? I want to uh, say I'm very happy to be here. I'm Nancy Lee Bentley, holistic health expert. And I, I guess because of all the things that I've done with food, just about everything you can do with food in every part of the food system, uh, I, I do call myself a soup to nuts food, nutrition, and holistic health professional. It's a lot to cover, but we have a lot of, we have a lot of connections between things that we've sort of forgotten in a way, like between the connections between agriculture and food and nutrition. So I'm uh, covering that spectrum or trying to make the connections and helping people make the connections uh, with a full circle bridge, a soil to spirit bridge, I call it, because we are um, not just physical bodies and we are a multiple level, uh, we're multiple beings. We have multiple levels and mul multiple members of our individual families. So I'm uh, attempting with my speaking, my writing, uh, coaching, and my activism, which I, <laughs> I, I often say my big mouth has gotten me into trouble more than once talking about some of these uh, things like, oh, GMOs and health freedom and these kinds of things. But 
uh, somebody's got to do it, right? And yes, <laughs> that's right. So, uh, but all in all, I would say that it's been an A to Z full banquet of lessons and learning experiences, a full, full, full buffet of learning lessons uh, from uh, writing this asparagus to zucchini book for the uh, local food systems in uh, Wisconsin. Um, I developed wheat-free recipes for Cher when she was going through her, you know, cro her, you know, Epstein Barr fa uh, phase, and I actually made Prince's purple flowered birthday cake when I was uh, working as a bakery uh, worker in Minneapolis, and I also helped to organize the Organic Trade Association. Uh, those are just a few of the things that have that have gone and happened during this journey. Uh, with food in my life. So, why are we here? I want to just briefly, you know, what I'm hoping that we can do today is expand our window of perception and our, our uh, awareness to get a bigger picture about what's going on with food and health today. Um, one of the principles that I'm always talking about is you are the expert when it comes to your own body, your own health. And I'm also pretty, pretty outspoken when it comes to let's, let's look at the writings on the wall, let's be real about what's going on, let's call it like it is. But let's not get overwhelmed, let's get together and let's get around to it to work together and build the new kind of food system that we, that we really need. In some ways, that's getting back to some of the former things that have gone on that we've almost forgotten about. <clears throat> um, here's, one, here's one of my, uh, my little ditties, and I, I say, basically, you know, minds really are like umbrellas. They function best when open. So I hope that you will be, have a, I hope that you'll take this opportunity and just uh, have an open mind about what some of the things that I'm going to be talking about, because it may not be what you may not be what you've been hearing uh, uh, on the routine level. Please give a warning. If you don't like puns, wordplay, corniness, and all of that, you can leave now because this is just who I am. I've been called corny, fruity, and nutty. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the only one that really offended me was now was being called corny because corn now used to be the mother grain. It was like the foundation of the food, and now it's been so aberrated with hybridization, genetically modification, high fructose corn syrup, and all of these things that it's literally, it's a really toxic food now. We won't even call it a food now because <laughs> the corn and soybeans that grow in the cotton, or I mean in the corn fields, and uh, the soybean fields in Illinois where I live now, uh, are really basically like an industrial ingredient. So anyway, you've been warned. You can leave if you want. <laughs> so with, with all the challenges that we're having today, this is what I'm saying. It does take a lot of guts to be healthy. And I know I'm pretty edgy with this, but like, as I said, let's call it like it is. What challenges, what, what challenges are we talking about here? Many of them, if you want to you want to uh, sum it up and, and put it one big word on it, would be stress. On many levels, we're experiencing stress, and that's one of our biggest problems uh, for our overall health. So, what's wrong with this picture? Picture, we're living in a country that is dependent upon corn, soy, reduced to a small uh, number of foods. We've got many, many, too many calories, devitalized uh, foods shipped all over the country, and it's a very expensive capital and resource intensive system, and it is not sustainable. And at the same time, even though we have all this food, we've got diabetes, addictions, autism, all of these weird diseases and chronic problems that are really uh, stumping, in a lot of cases, the medical profession 
and uh, so I'm, I'm ca constantly talking about the health careless system or the disease care system that we have that is literally threat threatening to bankrupt our economy. All right, let's, let's do a few, let's just take a look at a few of the challenges that we've got going on. I talk a lot about our inner and our outer ecology because one's a mirror of the other. We see lots of mirrors. But, I mean, look at this list. Chemicals in the food system on all levels from agriculture, uh, food, uh, pharmaceuticals, processed foods, GMOs. Ha, huh, what happens when you add radiation to GMOs? Oh, boy. I know. It's like, oh, I don't want to hear about this stuff. This is like, can be overwhelming. Uh, but there are lots of mixed messages. There are a lot. And how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? There are global agendas that are going on. Beyond the purview of this discussion, uh, there are a lot of things happening. And, it, and uh, it isn't all in our favor. And w besides the outer ecology issues, the things going on in our world outside of us, we have our own inner ecology challenges with lots of food, but what's the quality of a lot of that food, right? Lifestyle choices, addicting food technology, literally. We can talk about that a little. There's a lot of poor nutrition out. Uh, we have a lot of issues, chronic health issues. All of the major diseases, chronic lifestyle diseases, are related to the choices that we make. So we are, we're, we're dealing with a lot of, a lot of disconnection. That would be another word I'd put on our disconnecting and disconnecting, being disconnected from our outer world. We're doing a lot of texting. Sitting in a restaurant, and have you ever seen this? People texting, and they're texting each other, and they're sitting across from each other, and they're like, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, technology is great, but like, come on here, right? And then that's that's just the that's just the the accepted norm now, right? Whoa. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that example, because that, that's just one example of how, much, uh, how many things are going on that we're not even aware about. I mean, even the electrical circuitry, you know, this has an, is having an impact on us. But, you know, how overwhelmed do we want to get here, right? It could be. It can be overwhelming. However, it is pretty clear that our inner, both our inner and our outer ecology are messed up. And they're mirrors of each other. That's one of my major messages. And uh, hoping that you can see some of the connections here. But, and there, um, I mean, there's others. You know, our thinking, our, the way that we're programmed. And who's responsible? Who's accountable in this time now, anyway? It's like, we're living in a pretty dysfunctional uh, culture. Um, all right, so. It really takes a lot of guts to be healthy. I believe that. And when we're talking about guts here, another double meaning, right? We're talking about both levels of the meanings of guts. When you talk about guts, courage, stamina, intent, backbone, that's a vernacular. That's a sort of a, you know, colloquial expression that we use about having the courage to do what we need to do. But then Guts also, in this reference, is talking about our inner innards, our gastrointestinal tract, our digestive system. So uh, both apply here. All right. Now, these may be 
some of the things that you're, you may have heard some of this stuff and you may uh, subscribe to some of it or maybe foreign to you, but this is some of the things that I have really discovered in my whole process, which is not just about food, but about the whole circle of health. And that is, I know the more I have been studying, discovering that we do create our own reality. It seems like, oh yeah, right. <laughs> but when you really get down to it, every choice that you make creates new neural pathways within our neurochemistry. And so we reinforce the choices that we make and um, our, our, our system's very adaptive. Um, but sometimes we create habits that are not the best, right? Anyway, here's another one of those, uh, uh, one of those little uh, phrases that I say to people. You know you're not just that body. And we tend to, you know, the government and the, the, the traditional healthcare establishment is always talking about the body approaches and health from dealing with the physical body. But the reality is that we are a body, but we're also a mind, we have an emotional body, we have a spiritual body. And you cannot you can't really connect or disconnect them. You can't really separate them because your mind affects your body, your emotions affect you. Right? It all works together. And when you really see this larger picture, it, it's so amazing how, how in connected we are and how adaptive we are. Uh, we are all one, and uh, that may seem strange because we seem so disconnected, but on, on energetic levels, on spiritual levels, we are all one. And there are no accidents or coincidences. Okay, we'll just move on now. <laughs> All right. I want to just share with you a quick thing about my, what I call my own less than savory authentic story. Um, when I was writing the Truly Cultured book, after I had been doing a lot of active work with Dr. Mercola, uh, Dr. Mercola and I wrote, co-authored, Total Health Program. And uh, after that, and I was writing a lot about global politics and health freedom and so forth. So then I was, I was, con I was uh, actually hired to write a book. Although the book that came out uh, was much different than the book that I was hired to write a book about fermented foods for health. And I'm saying, well, that's good, but there's a bigger story here, and it's a connected story that needs to be told because there's lots of books about, you know, cultured foods or fermented foods now more and more. But uh, so anyway, well, it turned out a lot of so-called errors happened. And um, I ended up publishing this book myself. Uh, default publisher, not knowing anything about it. It's like, oh boy, okay. So meanwhile, I get the book. I have a whole run of 7,500 books printed by a, a publisher, quality job and everything. But then, about six weeks into, after the books are out, this rep who is, sent, who is, who is uh, you know, helping me to get things into the libraries and sales, he goes, Nancy, there, there's, no, there's no blue pages in some of these books. Well. That would be the last section of the book with promotion and all of that kind of stuff. And so I'm like, hmm, okay. And then it turns out that the books were misbound at the printer. I'm like, oh, okay. How often does this kind of thing happen, right? I'm like, oh my gosh, I had a whole national launch planned. I, you know, I had all of these pieces, but there's a sequence when you publish a book. You, you have to fit in the time window when the book buyers are going to be buying and all of that. So uh, they had to take all the books back. Every single book, go through every book and every case, and some of them were okay and some of them were not. But meanwhile, what happened was it trashed my launch, timing-wise. So that really threw me into the pits, into a very, you know, depressive cycle. And um, 
And this is, of course, where I, I came up with the phrase of, yeah, it's not healthy to be a health activist <laughs> these days because I'm talking about things that are in direct confrontation to the sort of mainstream way of looking at things, the, di the disease and the germ theory of disease and so forth, when in reality, we'll find out a little bit later that it, it's, um, it isn't just that simple. So meanwhile, I had to go through a seven-year period. This book has not gotten out like it should, but mm, it's calling it like it is. It's saying you can be healthy. You're in charge of your own health. It is an empowering support and how-to you know, vehicle. Um, maybe some people don't want this information out. Oh, I have a feeling. Nevertheless, uh, in the process of that, um, I found a reason, and I, I had to go through and heal my whole self. I had to go through every part of myself and really look at myself, because I had to accept responsibility for the fact that I created that, even though, oh, it was a mistake at the publishers, but on some level, I know I created it, and, but there was a higher purpose. How many, how many times have you seen where a negative accident, problem, or whatever results in a good, whether it's mad mothers against drunk driving, the, the guy that loses his arm. There are reasons why these things happen. Everything happens for a reason. And it isn't always fun. It's, it's hard to avoid pain, although I say pain is unavoidable. Suffering is optional. <laughs> it's like, right? So anyway, so I, I went through both, and I had Finally, then I realized, aha, okay, this is part of the lessons that I needed to in healing my own self. And then, as a result, it's, it's actually yielded a new chapter in a new book that's coming out, 101 Great Ways to Compete in Today's Job Market. Uh, that is being put out by selfgrowth.com, and this book is probably going to be out in the next month or so. Um, my chapter, Recipe for Succeeding Inside Out. So I talk a lot about even in the business environment, you can, you can create your own, you do cre we do create our own reality. But what happens when you get, le when you, when you get lemons? If you've got a body, you're going to have lessons. Spiritual lesson. So I say, if you if you got lemons, make lessonade out of it. <laughs> okay, yeah. So anyway, if you are interested, uh, you know, we can give you some more information about that. You could even get an advanced copy if you want here. Uh, but anyway, I'm just trying to show you that, you know, everything has its place, and everything circles, as I say, everything circles in season and bears fruit in its time. All right, let's go through quickly just some of the the myths about being healthy that we hear these days. Okay, all right, eat a balanced diet, get your vitamins and your supplements, make sure your sa food is safe and sanitary and calories, right? A lot of information about calories out there, even whole grains. Fat makes you fat, mm, maybe not. Uh, the doctor knows best, of course. Oh. What do I know? I'm no expert. I don't have a scientific background. I mean, how can I know what's best for me? Um, but science and technology will find a solution for all of our problems, correct? Uh, no, actually, it doesn't matter. There's just everything causes cancer. There's just no way around it. I'm, I, I'm just, it's overwhelming. So what can I do? I'm just one person. Uh, oh, I like this one. Eating healthy is too expensive, right? Eating healthy takes too much time, it's too hard. You can lose weight without being healthy. Just, you don't even have to change your eating habits, right? Just take that pill. And then there is one diet that's best. These are just some of the common things that are out there. But I'm saying it's just not true. It's just not true. And so furthermore, I, I've written a booklet on that, which I give as a bonus for a bonus as an ebook for buying the truly cultured book. Times are tough, but you can be healthier and eat for $40 a week or less. And that is 
even organic, sustainable, healthy local food. Now, you're not going to do that by going to the deli at Whole Foods. Uh, I, I know you'd have to go to Ithaca, but you know. Uh, you're not going to do it that way. It's like we got to get more involved in our food system. We can, though. We, um, we tend to think that our food is very expensive, and it, the prices have gone up, but it is still possible. So that's what I'm talking about in this booklet, um, which you can get as a print booklet, or you can get uh, a download with the book. And here's the other thing. Oh, there's only one best diet? Well, I'm saying, here's my proof. I'm going to give you my gift to you for coming today is a download, a free download from a chapter from Truly Cultured called The Rainbow of Food and Dietary Trends. And um, so we're going to, my sister Barbara, who lives here in Syracuse, and my my uh, business associate Stan helping me today, I'm gonna give you a clipboard so you can sign up and we'll send you access to that uh, copy. Uh, that is just one chapter that talks about the whole spectrum of diets. There isn't just one, there are lots of ways. I just found out that uh, Vander, uh, Anginus, Anginus Vander Planets, who's this guy who talks about live cultured dairy and meat products, not vegan vegetarian. He's, he's doing fermenting meats in his yard and stuff like He just died, like August 28th. He, he, he uh, broke his back and, I mean, really, it's like, uh-oh, okay. Well, anyway, hmm. <laughs> anyway, it's just, it's, it's like, oh my gosh, there's so much going on, right? Oh, he was in his 50s, and he was talking about, you know, and so that's another of the diets. Thank you. That's another of, you know, another of the diets. People heal themselves with that. They heal themselves with macrobiotics. They heal themselves with live raw food, with vegan, with vegetarian food. So there's more than one way to eat. And so that's what I'm trying to say is expand your window. It depends on you, your body, who you are, what you're beliefs are, where, you know, what your physical activity is, what your spiritual beliefs are, but you're the one that's going to have to determine that. Anyway, sign up on that sheet and we'll make sure you get that. So, here's a question. I know. Oh, I know. It's true. It definitely is. And, you know, of course, when I'm, I do the best, you do the best you can. You do the best you can, you know. Bless it, you know. People talk, you know, there's a, it's, you're, you're right. Water's one of the biggest problems that we, it is a big problem. But you do the best you can. So a lot of times when I, this is, I like the old Bob Dylan phrase, take what you need and leave the rest. So when I'm praying over my food and I'm not, I can't get the food I want, I carry my food with me usually, but if I can't, what do I do? I just pray, let me take what I need out of this and let me just leave the rest, okay? Intent, belief, yeah. Oh, very acidic, right? Water, it, water is a, a, a very problematic issue, and it's going to be more and more. Um, and we could probably spend a whole we could we could spend a whole class on that. But you're right; it is uh, is a challenge. So, and it's it takes education, it takes energy, it takes guts and courage to make and you know to find out what's the best way. And it's it's not easy. It is doable though, and. I say this, what do you want? Because it's all about what your choices are. You know, some people don't care. They're like, ah, the, all those myths that we were talking about. We are responsible for our own health, and we create our own. So it's like, if we can focus on what we, choices we make, and what we can do, 
then that's our route for finding our way. Because we will get additional help once we make that commitment to be healthy. I've seen it again and again and again. And it comes out of sometimes out of nowhere, right? Just phew, amazing. Depending on your beliefs, your attitudes, your intentions, and, and what you are going to be doing. I say we all have to find our own roadmap to health. And I have been working to attempt to help people to do that. As we have to tune into our own system, our own body, our own higher self, because we have a body wisdom that's directing us as well. If we can hear, and there are so many distractions, that's one of the problems where, where so, there's such a focus outside that we can hardly sometimes hear the dis from, for the distractions that are going on. And that includes stuff that we're eating too, right? Like cravings, for example, would be a good example, obscuring what's really going on. Although I say, listen to what your body's saying. Ayurvedically, <clears throat> the Ayurvedic uh, philosophy says that the cravings that your body have are a good indicator of what you need. But we're not talking about, well, of course, chocolate. Chocolate is its own food group, so we leave that one alone, okay? But when you say uh, beets versus donuts, all right, when you're craving beets, then your body knows there's a lot of nutrition in there, and not most people are craving donuts, right? But what I'm saying is cultivating and listening to that deeper hunger, because you know already what's going on with your own body. I know you do. It's just that we're not always focused there. And we don't feel confident often, you know. Now, I realize I'm talking to choir here because <laughs> you're shopping in the healthy place to buy food here. But um, that's what we, I think we're all being charged with that. All right, so, and I do have an online training program that you can find more, uh, uh, you can find more about and um, put that in your interests if, you're, if you want to know more about that. So, okay, all right, so we, talk a little about food, but, but here's a question for you. Is it what you're eating or what's eating you? Yeah. I mean, we all have stuff that on an emotional level, on mental, that's bugging us. You know, uh, it's just we're saying we are more than just a physical body. So we need to be cognizant of that. And again, you know you're not that body, so there's other things going on. And it's about exploring and hearing, listening, and remembering who we are, because that's really what it's about in the long term. So we are a body, mind, heart, and soul. We have to remember who we are, our members, or family members. And we're really on a path toward whole health. Uh, notice on this picture here with the body, mind, heart, and soul, uh, notice the uh, mind there has a lock there. And it works better when, uh, when, when the mind's unlocked, right? But let's get back to some basics. Uh, what are keys that we can talk about for being healthy? And one of the big, big ones is really about digestive stress, because a lot of these chronic diseases Lifestyle diseases are digestive re related. Um, you are unique, you're the expert of your own body, and no matter what, because what does the doctor say when you go in, and even if you go to a doctor, what does he say? What's wrong with you, right? <laughs> you, listening to your body is one of the things. Now, some of the other things, more specific things, like remember we were saying fat is, well, fat makes you fat. Well, you know what? Fat is not a four-letter word, actually. It's a three-letter word. And it isn't fat, usually, that makes us fat like we think. We've been given that information. But carbs are the thing that affect us more. And the glycemic index in carbs, uh, carbohydrates, especially processed flours and, uh, you know, and sugars and these kinds of carbs, are probably the one single thing that affects us most. And even when you're, even if you're, you know, eating organic, uh, the book that I did with Dr. McCullough was on was totally grain free. Um, and it is possible. And I know that I, you know, working with people who are trying to improve their digestive health, when they get off of 
the grains and the carbs for a period of time to relieve that digestive stress and help to reset the digestive system. They feel a lot better. They have more energy and so forth. Um, anyway, balancing blood sugar is a really important thing and probably one of the key things. And one of the reasons why eating vegetables is, now we need the carbohydrates and so forth from the vegetables. It's the starches and the flours and the grains that really do spike the blood sugar and then create problems that your body has to take care of it. When you're, when you're, even if you're eating whole grains, there are, a, there's a spike going on in blood sugar, then your, your body has to secrete insulin to bring down the blood sugar, and then we keep, we keep, up, you know, abusing that, and then the pancreas finally goes, oh, I give up, I can't keep up with this. Um, cortisol gets involved. Uh, that's, you know, the, um, how many people do you see in this country that have this cortisol, belly fat, that's from, that's really when your system is, you know, is, is in distress and you, and it's gone into the adrenal system. There's, there are four, there are, are actually five blood sugar mechanisms uh, affecting blood sugar. Four of them raise the blood sugar, one of them lowers it. And that's because as Paleolithic man, back when 99% of our, our genetics were set, we were hunter-gatherers. We were eating, you know, roots and shoots and seeds and nuts, you know, those kinds of things. And meats too, but not uh, a lot of the grains. So then uh, when we domesticated food and we started growing grains and other crops and then started domesticating animals, then we became more sedentary. We had a more stable food supply, but actually it was, um, it, it, it changed our dynamic. Because in the beginning, we didn't know, as hunter-gatherers, we didn't know where our next meal was gonna come from. So we had to be able to have a mechanism that would raise the blood sugar so that you could keep a stable blood sugar uh, no matter if you didn't eat for three days or one day or whatever. So now, What's happened is we're completely in the opposite situation. We have so much food and you know readily available, and then now we have one mechanism, the pancreas and the insulin, that will lower the blood sugar, but it's way, way overloaded now. It should be the other way around. Uh, and eat whole, live, real, local foods. Uh, again, I'm talking to the, to the choir here, I think, but uh, proteins are really extremely important, whether you are a vegetarian or whether you're a, uh, an agenous, a raw, uh, fermented meat eater. <laughs> Protein is really important. And one of the problems that we've got now is genetically modified food is locking up. The glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup Ready, is locking up the amino acids, especially the what aromatic amino acids, that would be like tryptophan and tyrosine. And um, tryptophan is the one that is produces serotonin. Serotonin is that feel-good chemical, neurochemical within us, and that makes us gives us that ease and that grace and, and that feeling good. Because we're not digesting proteins properly, we're trying to get it from carbs. Uh, trying, but it's not a very efficient process. And so um, it, the, the, the protein issue is a really big one. And notice that with allergies, where people have gluten allergies or soy or egg or milk, it's the proteins in those foods that people are having uh, issues with digesting. Okay, eat uh, live, organic, local, in season, food if you can. Get closer to your food, and I'm not saying stand by the refrigerator at night when you're raiding at your midnight snack. I, okay, and let's get together. Let's work together, because we have to. We're a small group, and uh, you know, I, I think there's a huge wave of consciousness happening, but it's going to need us, it's going to require that we work more together. Okay, maintaining good neurochemistry. This could be a whole talk in itself, how the hormones and your blood sugar balances. These are really important uh, because addiction, and look at all the addictions we have in this culture. 
they come from an imbalance in neurochemistry. And the carbs, unfortunately, you know, do have a big impact on, on unbalancing that. So water, probably should be talking about that in the beginning. We were talking about water. It's a really important thing, but it's hard to get good, good quality water, isn't it? And yet, it's, believe it or not, well, here's one thing I know that traditional medical and the alternative, I mean, I should say the allopathic or, you know, the, the standard medical profession and the complementary alternative medicine profession are coming together and they do agree that inflammation is one of the bottom lines of health and one of the bottom lines problems of, that we have with all these chronic diseases, whether it's overweight, diabetes, ADHD, um, cardiovascular problems, inflammation. When you don't get enough water, it actually creates a fire or a friction and a, a fire within your cells. So what does that tell you? If you don't get enough water, you are, you know, you're contributing to that inflammation, which is so rampant in our population. Move it or lose it. Okay. Bottom line, though. Okay. If, and I looked at all different kinds of things. I was looking at pH. I was looking at all these different. What is the bottom line of health? And this was before I started actually writing this book. But as I got into it, I realized digestion is the key to your health. It is the bottom line of health. And it is, I mean, your digestion is like 70 to 80% of your immunity, okay? So uh, your immunity is your first line of defense. That's really all that we have to really protect ourselves in this over the, all the onslaught of things that are going on. We can make good choices, but it's uh, maintaining and keeping good immunity and good immune system is really important. So probiotics, as you know, are becoming more and more popular, and we have probiotics. Huge, huge numbers now, right? The, the yogurt aisle and the kefir aisle is like getting very big, and, um, and there are all kinds of also supplements, probiotic supplements. Um, uh, there's lots of ways to get them, although in my experience now with working with the Truly Cultured book and so forth, I know that the really, ideally, the best way is to get the probiotics from your foods, if you can, from the live culture foods. All right, and it's not rocket science. It's <laughs> it isn't that difficult. Um, one of the things, though, that's key here, and it, I, you know, if there's nothing else that you take away from this, it's about your, the importance of digestive health. Your gut, this is what we're talking about, the guts, right? Gut is really an acronym for gastrointestinal tract, and that is from your, this opening here to this opening here. It's a tube that goes through you, and the food has to get broken down and absorbed through the membranes into your body. Otherwise, it's not in your body proper. So really, your gut, your gastrointestinal tract is actually the true YouTube. <laughs> All right, now, besides probiotic health and digestive health, we have another aspect here, and that is the, the, um, the phrase, have you ever had a gut instinct or a gut feeling? This did not come out of thin air. This is actually related to the fact that we have a thinking brain and we have a gut brain. You actually have intelligent cells within your system in your gut. And if that's really the seat of your intuitive or your feeling brain. And those two brains, the thinking brain and the feeling brain, are supposed to work together. This is one of the disconnects that we've got. And that's one of the problems with ADD and ADHD and other cognitive disorders. When, because your gut is your second brain, and when you don't have a good health in your gut, in your digestive tract and so forth, then you have a disconnect going on in the system in the messengers, in the uh, whole functioning of what's going on within your system. And this is where the, I don't know, have any of you heard of GAPS, the uh, gut and psychology syndrome? Uh, this is a, a, some of the work done by Natasha 
um, Campbell McBride. Has, uh, this is really important work. She's been bringing this forth within the last year, few years when I brought my book out. So um, uh, it, this is important and more, more than we think because what we've seen is that when you start giving kids uh, who have ADD and ADHD and other cognitive problems, when you start giving them probiotic-rich, friendly bacteria foods and supplements, they actually start connecting up. They start changing their behaviors. They start acting different. Their mood and their behaviors are different. And it's, it's really, really interesting to see the shift with just those, that alone. A lot of times, leaky gut, where you have allergies, that's a part of it, certainly. And, and laying off the foods that will stress your system are important during that. But just adding those probiotic-rich foods is really important. Um, there's a whole sequence that goes on. When you don't have good probiotic bacteria in your gut, friendly bacteria, you have a problem with candida. It's, it's almost a mechanical thing. The bacteria are these friendly probiotic uh, bacteria are the protectors, and they're in your, in your digestive system. There's more of those bacteria in your system than there are cells in your own body. It's amazing. Uh, but when they are not there and then uh, they start to get aberrated, killed off by microwaves or sugar or that kind of thing, then you start having problems with yeast and candida. Cravings are another symptomology there. It leads into further problems with addiction. And, uh, but we're really talking about an environment which in your gut, which we call dysbiosis. It's out of balance. Now, leads to, among other things, inflammation and then further disconnect with brain function. But th the thing is that the, these probiotic-rich bacteria are part of that missing link that are, that is part of that we really, that we really need to be uh, main, make, making sure that we've got the good bacteria and friendly bacteria within our system. So we're talking both about the inner ecology and the outer ecology. And the microorganisms that create these live cultured foods, they're the ones, the friendly bacteria. People have been eating these foods for hundreds of years and keeping healthy with them. But that's the source. That's where they are coming from. So anyway, it's, uh, I see a lot of circles. And you'll notice that if you look at this book, you'll see circles on every page of this book because it is all about the connections that we have going on within ourselves. So this truly cultured book, Rejuvenating Taste, Health, and Community with Naturally Fermented Foods, is about this message of these favorite cultured foods and the microorganisms that are responsible for them. And they affect so much of us. Like, for example, the taste. These, these cultured foods, for example, we're talking about taste, health, and community. We're talking about taste. These cultured foods, most people forget that these are our favorite foods. OK, what kind of foods are we talking about? Ah, chocolate, cheese, wine, beer, yogurt, kefir, kombucha, sausages, pickles, condiments. There are 80, over 80 varieties of cultured or fermented foods all over the world. And um, they are different, different qualities of them. And the kind that make, for example, beer and wine, the alcohol fermentation, uh, the later stages of fermentation, the, we don't have as many of the good bacteria in as the early or what's called lacto-fermentation. And it doesn't mean milk, OK? Lacto, we think of milk, but uh, lacto-fermentation is the name of this early stage of fermentation and produces these good foods, the taste of these foods, as well as the health. So the microorganisms are really the, the ones that are responsible for the characteristic tastes of different artisanal foods. Like Notice how cheeses are different in different areas, and breads, too, in different areas of the country because of the different microorganisms that are inherently there. And so uh, we, we forget that these are like a lot of our favorite foods. 
but they're also very involved and important in our health. And so whether you're talking about antacids and yeast meds or diabetes to antibiotic resistance, we're talking about how those probiotic friendly beneficial bacteria are helping us to keep our uh, environment in line. And I'm saying that these fermented and cultured foods are a, one of the missing links for being able to help you stabilize your gut. Um, germs are not the enemy. And by the way, um, well, I say germs are not the enemy. They are actually the maintenance and cleanup crew. Uh, Louis Pasteur, who discovered and confirmed that we have microorganisms, was a chemist. He wasn't a doctor. He was working for the beverage industries, the wine and the beer industries in, uh, in the Europe. And he managed to convince the prevailing medical society that, oh, we have these disease pr producing microorganisms. But his philosophy was, well, you've got these bugs, these microorganisms, microbes, bacteria, and so forth. They're there. You can't do anything about them. They can come inside of you, and you don't have any defense. Well, that was his sort of, that's how he convinced the medical profession to adopt the disease, uh, the germ theory of disease. But on his deathbed, he admitted it wasn't the microorganisms themselves. It was the terrain, the biological terrain, the environment. Because as we know, generally you do not you don't blame the rats for the garbage heap, do you? Because the rats are drawn to the garbage heap, but they don't create it. And same with the bacteria. When you have your systems out of whack, you don't have the good bacteria that literally push out the pathogenic bacteria. They literally, physically, manically, mechanically push out and push away the pathogenic bacteria. It's almost a mechanical thing. But um, that's why they can be protective of us. But they change and morph based on the conditions. And I have seen cancer cells, and they are loaded with fungus. So the bacteria change from bacteria into yeast into fungus. And they're constantly trying to adapt and help our bodies to you know, have a good homeostasis or a good balance. But, you know, when things keep getting more toxic and finally, after a period of time, the, the bacteria, uh, with the bacteriophage is actually one of the parts in the, in the key part of the, um, the cell that says, this is just too much trash here. We're out of here. It's toxic. We've got to break everything down. And then, so you have a breakdown. And that's, it's a good thing we have fermentation. Uh, to you know, break things down and get them back into their components. So the bacteria then change and morph and go back to their original form. It's like you can't even destroy them uh, at, at, the, at least the bacteriophage, that part of the mitochondria that signals what's going on. It's real interesting. You probably haven't heard a lot about that before previously, right? And so, they change, and that's why cancer really, when you get down to it, ends up being a fungus. And you can see it in an electron microscope. You can see the fungus, the candida, the fungus, the yeast, all over the uh, cells. Okay, quickly, uh, digestion really is about how we get our nutrients. If you don't have good, you don't have a good digestive system. You're not going to break down the waste products, and you're not going to be able to take in the uh, nutrients. There are over 100 trillion microorganisms, and there are like more than 1,000 species. We've only discovered about 4% of them. Um, but in your, in your gut, in your digestive system, they outnumber your cells by a factor of 10 to 1. So we're almost like we're 10% human and like 90% bacteria, I think. But we, of course, have this uh, different idea. Like we're superior to them, right? But bottom line, digestion is close to 80% of our immune system. So we have some new perceptions to, to expand here, right? OK, quickly, cultured and fermented foods are basically foods produced by this process of fermentation. And fermented foods, uh, they they use this process, it's a natural process. What, do you, what happens when you put 
fresh squeezed apple juice on the counter, not pasteurized, just fresh squeezed, what happens? Right? It ferments, right, exactly. It's a process. Ultimately, where does it go? It goes to vinegar, right? Yeah. Uh, now we pickle and we make pickles and condiments, which a lot of these foods, the cult, you know, the probiotic rich culture foods, were condiments to be eaten with a small amount, you know, small amount, sauerkraut, salt, pickles, these kinds of things were digestive aids. And they were supposed to be served in a small amount as, a, as a, an assist to digest heavy meats and, you know, all these foods. This is how people kept healthy for thousands of years before we had you know, uh, other supplements and things like that. Uh, again, back to that purely mechanical almost thing of the good bacteria versus the bad. I think we should have a movie about microbia, about the world that's going on within us, because it, within and without us. All right, fermentation is the process. Culturing is our use of this fermentation process to produce all these nice foodstuffs. And there are lots of benefits now. And I am, uh, we have to really look at time here. Um, the, the good bacteria that are coming from these foods that you can you know, produce, that you can uh, have from very simply, cheaply, easily, economically, um, they do protect your gut, protect your digestive system, and uh, not only in, well, in multiple ways, including helping you to pre-digest pre food, strengthen your immunity, changes your body pH from acid to alkaline. And we know about that the more we, you know, we get into health. Acid and uh, pH is a, is, is a variable. It's not what you, you can't really try to be completely alkaline because your body changes pH all the time. Urine, blood, and saliva are all different at different times of the day, but it's an indicator of what's going on in your body. Uh, believe it or not, when you eat these probiotic-rich cultured foods, it will actually produce, reduce your craving for sugars. And that's something we have found. That's nice. And key thing, it reduces inflammation. And I've seen this again with clients when they cut down on the carbs, they really eat the healthy proteins, the vegetables, cut down on the carbs, then they start feeling better and they start eating the probiotic rich foods. And it's amazing, the transformations that happen. And it, it's not that you should be doing this forever, but giving your digestive system a reset, a time to rest, a time to reset is really, I think, important for all of us. And so this process, which is pretty amazing, this, these microorganisms create, it improves the taste of foods while preserving them. Um, and I believe there's a lot that we can use and learn from the bacteria that we're trying to constantly kill off here. But what do we need to get started? Uh, I use the, uh, the term the three C's about containers, glass, and these kinds of containers are good. Cultures, um, you need culture starters. Some of them can come from the air. Like when you do sourdough bread, that's wild yeast, wild bacteria in the air that will actually start that process. That's why when you, you know, you do the apple cider vinegar or the apple cider, apple cider on the counter, it's that nascent what's already in there that goes through its changes. Community is another part of when I call the requirements for, or it's ideal if we can do more with community. Because, okay, how many of you use kombucha or are familiar with that? Uh, it's an it's a amazing drink made from black tea and sugar. Who thought that the, this, this could be a healthy beverage? But when you put one of those scobies or symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast into the black tea and sugar, the sugar is the food it converts the beverage into a healthy, probiotic-rich beverage. It's like, oh, okay. Anyway, but um, sugar and tea, black tea, and then these the mushrooms. But when you make this kombucha, I have recipes for all these in there. When you make the kombucha, every time you do, it creates a new mushroom on the top of the stuff. So, you know, you, you're going to have a lot of mushrooms left 
over, so you got to share them, right? This is what uh, makes a logical sense. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's like, it's like makes, makes no, anyway, so what are some of the best cultured and fermented foods that we can start with? Well, here I use the acronyms of the three Ks, and that would be kefir, which is really just the beverages, and that would include, you know, yogurt and kefir. And um, Kefir is a, is a liquidy drink that is like yogurt, but it's, it isn't as solid. And they're, they're different organisms, different microorganisms. If you ever see cultured uh, kefir grains, they're like these little sparkling, clear crystal seeds. And they convert the milk into, they coagulate the milk and make it thicker. Uh, the yogurt bacteria make it really, will make it set up. The kefir are, it's more of a drink, so you can get that here. You can use that as a starter, buy some, and then create your own when you get home. Um, yeah, if you can get raw milk, that's ideal. Yeah, and I believe you can buy them uh, in a dry form, or you can get them. And you may have to, uh, this is where we need to create more community and culturing circles. Hmm? Well, if you get in touch with me, I have some sources for cultured, uh, you know, for some of these starters. Yeah. Yes, the Weston A. Price group, that's right. Weston A. Price, uh, which a, a lot of the, this book is talking about some of the traditional uh, food ways. Uh, the Weston A. Price groups have access to uh, cultured um, cultures and, as well as cultured products. And a lot of them uh, have raw milk groups. Um, you know, you want to, what's that? Oh, Weston A. Price? Weston A. Price, Dr. Weston A. Price was a dentist who studied a lot of cultures all over the world, and he found major changes when people started to eat refined processed foods. He tracked the changes in generations over a period of many years, and he took photographs, and you could see the changes in the teeth, in the, with, yeah, the facial structure, like very, you know, like these, Native people having really robust, round, beautiful faces, and then a couple of generations, even one generation, the face structure starts to thin. Interesting, yeah. So he documented this, and so there's been a, uh, how traditional foods have sustained people for many years. So, okay, so kefir would be the cultured beverages like the dairy products and so forth. Kraut would be, uh, your vegetables, you know, sauerkraut, not my favorite, but you know, sauerkraut and other cultured vegetables and pickles and those kinds of things, made with salt, not with, you know, vinegar, the end product of the process. And then, comp made with salt, yeah, just old, old time vat pickles made with salt and water, and the salt lowers the pH or the acidity makes it more acidic and creates its own vinegar. They are pickled, they are made with vinegar, they don't have the good probiotic bacteria. We're missing the point, right? Making your own is simple, cheap, and the reason to do them is because they will help to restore the good probiotic bacteria. So anyway, uh, another type that is easy to start is kombucha, which we talked about, fermented tea and sugar. Oh my gosh, amazing, but delicious. And when you start drinking this stuff and you start using these foods, you just see your body, your body goes, ah, oh, yeah. So it really does make a difference. Okay. And uh, here I go with the community saying, you know what? The bacteria have a lot to teach us about living in community. Because we're always trying to kill them off, right? But they actually do have, because you know what? They've learned how to get along and live in community. We're still learning about that, right? But my, I'm saying that let's learn from them and not try, because I think they're, personally, I think they're laughing at us. Like, you people don't get it. You're trying to kill us off, but we are, we are, you know, we're bacteria and they're us. And I, you know what, I'm going to just, um, this, there's so much to this whole, there's 
so much to this um, message about the bacteria and the microorganisms and the cultured foods and so forth, which I go into in this book, this truly cultured book. Half of it is cookbook and how to, and half of it is how did we get in this mess and what can we do about it? Nourishment guide. So half of the book is, is like showing how, how things changed and uh, not necessarily for the better, but how we can get back to and get around to it and get together and work together with producing better foods. And so uh, it's a complete zero to 60, including what you need to get started, containers, all that kind of stuff. It, you don't have to know anything. It isn't rocket science, and it's not that difficult. It's more about starting it, trying it, doing it. You'll find out, and people go, and I have frequently asked questions in there, so like, oh, can I kill my family with a bad batch? It isn't, you know, it's more about getting the confidence and working with, this is people, a lot of us grew up with these foods in our, you know, in our families and stuff like that. Anyway, I want to just, end up here with a little free, little short little video that, oh, let's see here. Okay. Uh. Yeah, and lots of jokes in there too as well. Um, let's see here. Okay, so, oh, what happened? Yeah, but now we're back in the beginning here. I just want a very short little closing video here. That a culture, it's actually a flash video that I have on my site. Um, as you can see, there's a lot here about this message about the bacteria. Um, okay. Windows need to All right, here we go.
And now uh, trulycultured.com has been the website I've used. Now I have a new website, which uh, you can pick up one of my cards. Feel free to email me, holistichealthexpert.com, because this is really about, a lot of people say, oh, you're that fermented lady. And I go, some people call it cultured. <laughs> anyway, uh, I really enjoyed talking to you tonight, uh, today. And uh, if you would like, uh, we'll be happy to, you know, answer any of your questions if you have any. Um, we're <clears throat> we have lots of different ways that we're attempting to help people to, you know, get and uh, restore the good good digestive system that we need to to be healthy. It it is a challenge, but we can do it, especially for working together. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well. Um, I'm not an expert in water, okay? So I don't want to say, you know, this is better, but uh, there, there, it's a, let's put it this way. There, there are a lot of, there are, thank you, there are a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of dynamics to that issue, and I think that we all have to, we're all going to have to explore that. I mean, I use a Brita type of filter because it's charcoal filter, and it will even, you know, the bar bark, I'm sorry, Berkey type systems, the water uh, filtration systems that are just gravity fed, they will filter pond water in, uh, because they're ceramic, um, ceramic filters that will allow only, you know, uh, the good water through and will filter out uh, bad bacteria and other, you know, chemicals and things like that. Uh, they use those in four third world countries. There are lots of different systems. So I, I really am not in where I want to, you know, make recommendations for you, but it is something we, we, we do need to do more about. And I have some other people that are working on purifying water, and they're associates that are experts in water, and, pure, and uh, Saratoga Springs, for instance, is a very interesting place where there's lots of good waters there. Um, it's a whole topic, and uh, we'll just have to leave it at that. Well, I, <laughs> I can't address that issue. I'm actually, we have a cottage on, you know, we're from Skinny Atlas as well. It's always been, had a good reputation. But there are so many things going on. So, you know, we tend to purify the water in addition. Yeah. Gastric reflux, yeah, reflux, uh, GERD. That actually is, there's, uh, there's a lot, you know, that's an, an aberration in, that's one of the problems that people have with not enough digestive, especially gastric uh, hydrochloric acid. What's ironic is hydrochloric acid. We don't have enough hydrochloric acid in our system. That's one of the reasons why we are getting that GERD. And the reality is that actually when you do uh, carbonate or Tums or that kind of thing, you actually are stimulating those gastric juices more. Gastric juice is stopped by acid, hydrochloric acid. So that's an indicator that we don't have enough hydrochloric acid in our system. And uh, we're, we're, I mean, you can, beets are another, actually a good source of the betaine hydrochloride you need to have your body produce more. And then some of the supplements, the enzymes and the digestive enzymes will have ox bile or, you know, some of those in. but. So you're better, actually, if you have GERD, you're actually better taking a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and putting it in water rather than doing a carbonate, uh, you know, a, um, an alkaline tablet or something like that. Well, you know what? You can do naturally carbonated from the fermentation process. That's what it's mimicking the carbonated, carbon, carbonic acid, phosphoric acids, those are, are chemically produced that those uh, natural, I mean, uh, processed carbonated drinks are not really good because first of all, they also have high fructose corn syrup in them as well. Uh, that's a whole other discussion. But anyway, so you're better off taking some apple cider vinegar than you are uh, one of those tablets to get rid of your to what? Oh, uh, you know, like 
a, a tablespoon or a couple of teaspoons in a glass of water. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, that's a good question. Modified food storage is one of those industrial ingredients that are produced from corn. It is. The problem is that 80, 80 to 90, depending on soy, soy and corn and other things, I say an average 90% of the industrial corn and soy, which are the major ingredients for our processed foods and commercial market, are genetically modified. And I, um, I mean, we're working on that issue, but I can't even address it because it's so controversial. And, uh, but we know that uh, you have to really research because there are different forms of corn now, dextrose. There is, you know, mono and diglycerides. There are, you know, different uh, high fructose corn syrup, modified food starch. There are many different forms that they do the corn in. Epstein bar, yeah. Uh, the gluten sensitivity is something that we're getting a lot of uh, awareness about. Gluten is one of those proteins that, first of all, we're not digesting. And by the way, when you do sourdough and sprouting of grain, it does digest and it does get rid of or break down some of those. But still, if you've gotten a really serious digestive problem like celiac uh, or something like that, you know, you need to lay off the, those grains. We really, you know what, I really don't believe we were supposed to be eating that stuff unless, again, unless it was fermented or cultured. And of course, what do they do with grains? They converted it into the sourdough and also beer, and, right? Because it was more digestible. And, you know, and in Europe, where they, they actually purify their water, but they, they you know, they, they drink wine and beer because their water is so poor, so you know, fermentation is a very, very interesting process, and these microorganisms are our our friends. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, I didn't hear you. Braid. Oh, brags, brags. Yeah. Well, okay. Here's a. That's a good question. When I ran a food allergy company in the 1990s in Illinois, and uh, we were talking about soy, okay, which uh, soy sauce and Bragg's is made from soybeans. But it's, Bragg's is not a fermented product. It's a hydrolyzed product. Now, I talked to Patricia Bragg, who runs Bragg's, and she assured me that there's no, you know, uh, MSG. And, but when you break down those, some of those foods through an industrial process, you can create a lot of additional compounds that may, not, may or may not be healthy. But um, Bragg's is not a fermented soy product. I think the only way to eat soy is if it's fermented. Um, that would be soy sauce. Miso, natto, uh, tempeh. Okay, tamari, uh, shoyu, and those traditional soy sauces that are fermented. It helps to break down, but soy is not a health food. <laughs> it really isn't, it, even though, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of foods that they've been making into uh, soy. Hmm? Right. No, actually what they do generally in the commercial process is that they will they want to they want to create an environment so that they control the growth of the certain bacteria. Lots of there there are lots of strains and they interact with each other and they sequence and so so you know, you can get a mixed bag of bacteria. They commercial manufacturers and even health food manufacturers want to be assured of the stability and the consistency of their product. So what they do is they pasteurize the milk, and then they inoculate the milk with additional bacteria, their strain, so that they can control and have a consistent product. Okay, my when I talk about making yogurt and things like that, I don't, I don't, or I don't heat the milk. I actually heat up the jars. 
I, you know, um, and uh, it's not about being anal about, you know, sterilizing either. But I'll heat up the glass jars and get the process going, right? Because temperature is a big issue. The faster, the fermentation goes faster with a higher temperature. When the temperature lowers, the fermentation slows down. So you can put those mushrooms, scobies, and kefir grains to sleep, even in your freezer or whatever. It may take some time for them to get awaken again, but the more heat there is, the faster that process goes. The, the lower the temperature, the slower that process goes. So, well, yeah, it is. I mean, uh, you know, I think, again, organic milk is the ideal. I wouldn't be eating commercial milk. I, I just, I don't, I think it's, there's too many hormones that they put in it and all of that. I say organic. Get your, if you can get raw milk, if you can get your own, or I know that, well, wow, is it interesting that they're going off after some of these, oh, come on, you know. This is where we get into, you know, some of the politics. Who, what's the big deal, right? We have, what's the big deal with trying to have healthy food? Some people, I have a feeling, don't want us to do that. What do you think? <laughs> anyway, you can, you, you know, usually the manufacturers will ver verify. But now they are genetically modifying probiotic supplements. Yeah, I know. Oh, thanks a lot, Nancy. Nice. They're, they're, no, that not necessarily. Well, well, look, if, okay, if you have a bacteria, like you have a yogurt or kefir or something, and it says bacteria regularis, if it's a made-up bacteria name, you can bet that that is a genetically modified or a standardized bacteria. They're, they're, they're creating their own patented strain of bacteria. That's what they want to do. So that, I know, I know, but you don't have to though. But, but if, but if it's, if it's like bacteria, like I said, if it's a made-up name. You know. Well, okay, regularis. Bacteria regularis is, you know. It's a made up name, yeah. So if. Yeah, I think some of those, like those large uh, companies, are producing strains of um, strain. Did you have a. Um, oh, well, a good point. Uh, Institute for Responsible Technology, uh, which ru uh, made the uh, movie Genetic Roulette, uh, which you can see if you are willing to <laughs> open. And, yeah, Genetic Roulette, the movie, is a movie that my colleague Jeffrey Smith uh, put this movie together. And they have a shopping guide, GMO shopping guide, responsibletechnology.com. ORG is the website, and you can download a uh, shopping guide to say, see which foods are possibly genetically modified and which may not be. So that's worth checking out. Um, they've done a lot of work there. It's an eye-opener, isn't it? <laughs>